Good afternoon, traders. Thank you for joining us for another Lightspeed webinar. Since the April 15th tax deadline is quickly approaching, we figured it would be a good time to review some of the tax issues that are impacting our active traders. And who better to have with us to speak about this topic than Robert Green. Robert is a CPA, and he's the founder of Green & Company. You can find them on the web at greentradertax.com. And if you're, not, if you're not familiar with Green & Company, you know, his firm is really renowned for helping active traders navigate our tech tax code, and making tax selections which allow them to realize the maximum tax benefits. So we just also want to make sure that everyone understands this webinar is for informational purposes only. We're not giving anyone any individual tax advice here. If you do need individual tax advice, you need to consult with your tax advisor. And of course, you can choose to have Green & Company be that tax advisor. We are going to be recording this webinar, as we do with all our webinars. So if there's anything you miss or you want to just come back at another time to see it, you can go to lightspeed.com forward slash webinar, and you'll see this presentation along with all our past webinars recorded on there. And of course, we want to take questions from the audience. So if there's anything that you want to ask, just use the webinar chat box. Type in your questions. Uh, we'll send them over to Robert, and he'll answer as many as time allows. So without further delay, I'll turn the presentation over to Robert. Thank you very much, Mike. Appreciate being here with Lightspeed and working closely with your firm and traders. So let's begin today's uh, webinar on trader tax benefits, qualifying for those benefits, the business expenses that you get when you qualify, which can save you $8,000, tax treatment and elections is very important knowing what you trade, trying to take advantage of better tax rates or ordinary loss treatment so you can write off losses, pay lower taxes on gains. How you apply this on a trader tax return, it's a little tricky, especially this year for 2011 with that form 8949 and the cost basis reporting. And then entities and retirement plans unlock a third level of benefit, adjusted gross income deductions for retirement plans and health insurance premiums. So let's continue into the slides. And just give me one second while I do a little. OK, thank you. So this is uh, educational today from us. And Mike did explain that. And Lightspeed is not giving tax advice, and we're not affiliated with them. We are a third-party tax service provider. My bio, thank you, Mike, for mentioning it. I'm the CEO of Green Trader Tax and Green Trader Funds. That's our website. Green NFH LLC is our virtual tax and accounting firm. We focus on traders and investment managers. I also lead tradersadvocacy.org to fight for the interests of traders. And people say I'm the leading authority on tax. You can read my book, The Tax Guide for Traders, from Grow Hill. And Green's 2012 Trader Tax Guide just came out with our annual tax return examples guides for 2011. You can see my articles in Active Trader on Forbes blog, in the major newsletters, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and I'm the main speaker at Traders Expo and Money Show. Here are a few current issues this year. Keep your eye out for the Bush era tax cuts. They expire at the end of this year. I don't expect a deal until the lame duck session, so tax planning will be a challenge, and you'll need to wait to the last minute. I covered this in depth in Green's 2012 Trader Tax Guide. I don't expect tax reform until 2013 at best. The current Congress can't decide something so important. They need to wait for the next Congress. But you can't wait for the next Congress on the Bush era tax cuts. They expire at year end. So there's no way they'll act before the election with both sides campaigning for their respective positions, which are diametric. Will tax benefits survive tax reform in the future? I believe yes, they will, because their business benefits. A flatter tax code hurts itemized deductions. That hurts investors with investment expenses. 
Business traders have above the line business deductions. If they lower the rate to broaden the base, we may get down to what's closer to a futures tax rate of 60-40 at 23%. There are some other threats looming, but I don't think they've really touched on traders. And they really haven't done what they've said they might do with high frequency traders, making them make a market. And other rulemaking from Dodd-Frank has been slow going. The Volcker rule is still being fought against. And some of the onerous things that people talked about, which weren't supposed to really hit traders, more were supposed to hit big banks, have not really happened yet. The financial transactions tax, we have our eye out for it. Hopefully it's not on the radar screen in the U.S. Germany and France are pushing it. The U.S. says no. If they pass it in Europe, you'll have to watch out that you don't trade, let's say, French stocks where the other side of the person on the other side of the trade may have to pay the tax and take it out of the spread. So I think you can navigate around this if and when it comes up in Europe. What's new on 2011 tax returns? It's that Form 8949. So let's focus in on these bullet points now. This is brand new this year. It's going to be disruptive for some, easier for others. The IRS is beefing up the 1099 reporting. They want brokers to report cost basis. So when you get your 1099s, which are coming late this year, you'll see 2011 cost basis for securities. You won't see options and you won't see many other things which are phased in over the coming years in 2012 and 2013. Some brokers might report 2010 basis, others won't. We've noticed that the brokers are uh, interpreting and applying the rules differently as well as their clearing firms who issue the 1099s. What's important to note is that you still need to do 100% reporting as you did last year. So trade log was the answer in prior years. You would download your trades. We add the tax knowledge to trade log. Barron says it's the best. This year, trade log will have form 8949. They're releasing the update any day now. We're going to have a webinar next week on it together with them. The long and short of it is that your 8949 is going to have a lot of different parts in it. Actually, let me just read through these bullet points so that we don't go too far off script. There's going to be a lot of challenges this tax season working with the 8949. Our trade accounting software partner trade log is going to have a good solution. And you should read the past blog and see the past webinar and the one this upcoming week. Now, if you're using TurboTax, they don't generate a Form 8949. That's shocking. They've punted. These software providers for tax preparation had to have stuff ready in January. This, these new rules just came out. The software providers haven't even seen the 1099s. So TurboTax punted. Now, many brokers are interpreting and applying the cost basis reporting rules differently, so their 1099s are going to look different. What you see on one will be different from another. And we've already, as a CPA firm, spotted many errors, things that we disagree with. Many brokers never really accounted for wash sales. Now they are, and some are doing it wrong. And we've seen some very large wash sale adjustments. I'm not talking about light speed. I'm talking about some other brokers that were wrong. And taxpayers would be overpaying their taxes if they don't get it right. So clients have already asked brokers for corrections. And the brokers say, no, they're not going to change their wash sale system. Now, on the 8949, you've all been deputized by the IRS who's hunting down tax cheats and they've put you in their posse and you have
have to be an accountant to now reconcile what your broker's issuing to your proper gain and loss numbers that ultimately go on Schedule D. And there are three parts, A, B, and C on the 8949 in both the short-term and the long-term area. A will be what's on the 1099, B is what doesn't match on the 1099, maybe because it's an 010 cost basis, and C is when you don't even get a 1099. Well, trade log will show you an adjustment at the end, adjusting all those parts to what it should be the correct information. And there'll be a, a footnote that is suggested that you include with your return. And it's important that you reconcile to the 1089, whether it's right or wrong, because the IRS is going to do that with their matching program. And if you don't match, or if you report lower proceeds than the broker does, or you report higher cost basis than the broker does, then you are so-called not up to snuff in their IRS eyes, and you might get a tax notice. So this is going to be disruptive. And if you have a large adjustment, you may want to consult with us about it to explain it further to the IRS. Why is there that adjustment? What did the broker maybe do different from what is correct to put into your tax return? You don't want to overpay your taxes. You don't want to underpay. Now, if you're Mark to market section 475, you file a form 4797. You don't file this form 8949. If you have an entity, like a partnership tax return or an S Corp, you don't file form 8949. That's a huge relief. So we're going to have more on that form and cost basis reporting. So we're definitely a, a place to go if you have questions about that or you need help. Now let's get into the guts of trader tax benefits. They apply to any type of trader, securities, futures, options, ETFs. Learn how to qualify for this trader tax status. That's what's key. If you qualify, you can claim it and use it for 2011. So if you're first learning about it today, you're in luck. You can use that part of the benefits for 2011, but you can't make tax treatment elections in most cases after the fact. That needs to be done contemporaneously. So to qualify, check the golden rules on our free Trader Tax Center, and you can enter that Trader Tax Center through Lightspeed. When you go into the Lightspeed Trader Tax Center, you then go over to our Trader Tax Center where there. Uh, logo around the center. Trader tax return tips. If you're going to claim the trader tax status for 2011, you're going to add a Schedule C, a profit and loss from business, to your Form 1040 individual tax return. And that's where you're going to include all your business expenses and potentially save another $8,000. But the trading gains and losses are reported on different forms. Securities go on Form 8949, which then feeds into Schedule D. You cannot enter items directly to Schedule D this year. Last year, there was something called a D1 attachment. 8949 sort of replaces the D1 attachment. So securities are Form 8949. They feed into Schedule D. Futures are on Form 6781. That's where you enter your Section 1256 contracts, which get broken down 60-40, 60% long-term, 40% short-term, and then move over to Schedule D. Now, if you elect Section 475 mark-to-market accounting, you use Form 4797 Part 2, Ordinary Gain or Loss. So look at the problem and the solution that's building here. Schedule C has your expenses, but your trading gains 
more losses are on Schedule D or Form 4797. So your Schedule C appears to be a losing business. In fact, there's no revenue or income. That's not something the IRS is going to be happy with. So when you're a profitable trader, in our tax return examples guides and footnotes, we show you how to transfer a portion of your business trading gains to Schedule C so we can make Schedule C zero and it doesn't show a loss. We don't show a gain either because you're not supposed to have a trading business gain on Schedule C and we don't want to open the can of worms about self-employment taxes from a Schedule C which traders don't owe on trading gains. So that strategy needs to be done properly and it's best to read our guides to see how to do it. It's beyond the scope of the today's presentation. Now the entity tax return looks a lot better than a Schedule C. First of all, it consolidates all the reporting. So you have your trading gains and losses, your portfolio income from trade, business trading, and expenses, business expenses on one tax return. And if you're using Section 475, Mark to Market Accounting, Ordinary Gain or Loss, which we recommend for securities traders only, you're just going to have you know, a net income number, trading gains minus expenses, business expenses that flows through on a Schedule K-1 to your Schedule E. And it's going to look like a profitable hedge fund. It's going to look so much better. And you're not going to have that Form 8949. You really should consider forming an entity soon to use for the rest of 2012. Now let's look at the business expenses. Hey, Robert, maybe be, maybe yeah. before we move on, there's a few questions that came in. Maybe you can address one Good. or two of those. Good. Let's take a look at those. TurboTax hopefully will include 8949 as a software update. And I really think that people should think about extensions this year because I also expect brokers to issue corrected 1099s whether you request one or not. And it's, I was shocked to hear from TradeLog that TurboTax is not issuing an 8949. I think that that's, that means they're not, their software is inadequate. I mean, I, I'm shocked. They, they have to get that together. So I haven't spoken to TurboTax. This is what I heard from Dave Ike and TradeLog. But this whole business with the cost basis and 8949 is, people are rushing and dealing with it last minute as well as the brokerage firms. The next question, I trade in a Roth IRA. I guess that I do not need to file 8949. That's correct. The only tax issues that you have with retirement plans is if you trade on with margin interest and you trigger UBIT. But that's correct. Trading a retirement plan, Roth or regular, would not need an 8949. Now you do need to calculate wash sales between your brokerage accounts, your taxable accounts, and your IRA. And if, if you sell a security at a loss on December 21st in your taxable account, and buy it back on December 22nd or 30 days before or after when you took the loss in your IRA, that's a deferred wash sale in your taxable account and you'll never really get the benefit in your IRA. Now a broker can't do the wash sale calculation between accounts that you may have at different brokers. Only trade log can. So this is an example of an adjustment on the 8949 where you'll be different from your broker. That's not any error from your broker. That's just that there's structurally no opportunity for the broker to know that about your IRA. 
Uh, there's another question, why are the tax regs different for investors versus traders? Well, the, the reason is that as far as the IRS is concerned, everybody is an investor when you open up a brokerage account. You have to really rise to the level of being a business trader and impress them to get those benefits. Investors have a lot of penalties in the tax code. They have wash sales. They have um, capital loss limitations, $3,000. It's never been indexed for inflation. A lot of people lost money, let's say, go, you know, when there were busts in the market and meltdowns. People lost a lot more than $3,000 and couldn't deduct it. Why are there these penalties? Well, there's also a huge carrot, the lower long-term capital gains rate, which is currently up to 15%. So this is, the, this is the government picking winners and losers and handing out carrots and using sticks. Well, business traders, they may have segregated investments, but besides that, they're not really trading for the long term. They're not going to get the lower long-term rate. Now, futures traders do benefit from the lower rate with 60-40, but securities traders don't. Securities traders want ordinary business loss treatment when they lose money because they may make a lot of money in 011 and lose it in 012, and they want to be able to get immediate tax relief with a carry back to get a refund. And they want to deduct their expenses. They have serious business expenses like other businesses, and they want to deduct their expenses. They want a home office deduction, 100% depreciation. I'm looking at this slide now, startup business expenses. They want to deduct their margin interest without an investment expense limitation, investment interest expense limitation. They want to deduct all their computers, software, services, supplies, travel to trade shows, education after they start their business, just like any other business. Now, Congress recognized traders in 1997 when they expanded Section 475, Mark to Market, Ordinary Gain or Loss, which code section is written for dealers who have an inventory. So Congress recognized that there were traders who don't have customers but who should be entitled to that code section as well. And that was pretty good at Congress. They, I guess they saw the online trading revolution in the 90s and came up with that adjustment. So let's go back to the slides here. Now, I did say that I recommend an entity because I think the Schedule C is a red flag and it's great for last year because you didn't have, maybe you don't have an entity for last year, so why not use the Schedule C to deduct your business expenses? Maybe you have a health insurance benefit already from a job or your spouse has health insurance at work. Maybe you didn't need a retirement plan contribution for 2011. So the Schedule C is fine, but going forward, the entity will look a lot better and it will unlock additional benefits, like those AGI deductions of retirement plans and health insurance premiums. The Schedule C can't do those AGI deductions. You need to have another source of earned income if you're a sole proprietor business trader, maybe another Schedule C from being a computer consultant or something. Most traders need the entity to get those AGI deductions. Now the first bullet point, we want to keep it very simple. Simple pass-through entity is all you need. Pass the income and loss to your individual return and don't pay entity level taxes. So this entity is a separate tax filer. It files a tax return with all your trading activity and expenses takes that off your individual return, files it with the IRS on a 1065 for a partnership or an 1120S for an S Corp, but it doesn't pay taxes. It issues you a Schedule K-1, which you probably have seen from ETFs or hedge funds or 
master limited partnerships or private business that you've invested in and you report the K-1 items which are summarized by tax treatment. So the K-1 says total short-term capital gains, total interest income, total section 475 mark to market accounting, total expenses. And you just put those totals on your individual return which makes it much less complicated. And if the entity passes you through capital gains, you could then offset it with your capital loss carryovers that you've had for a couple of years on your individual return. So you're still the only taxpayer as an individual, but you're filing two returns rather than one with a Schedule C and you're trading information all over the place. Now when you think of an entity, again, we're keeping it simple and low cost. You don't need liability protection when you trade your own money. You don't have investors. You don't have customers. So a married taxpayers should generally use general partnerships since they are the least costly to set up and there are no state minimum taxes as there may be with LLCs. In California, the LLC has an $800 minimum tax. The partnership is zero. In New York State, the LLC has a publishing requirement that could cost $1,000. Partnership, again, is zero. Partnership is portable from state to state. Inexpensive to set up, inexpensive to close. If you're not married and you're single, you don't have someone to be a partner with you. So we suggest an S-corporation filing. Now you can form a SM single member LLC and elect S-corporation status. That is the route that we prefer. Or you can form a corporation known as a C-corp and elect S-corp status. So, again, entities don't need the 8949. They also can elect mark-to-market accounting later in the year. We're going to talk about mark-to-market shortly. Now let's uh, talk about trade accounting. You're going to need to do the 8949, and if you're trading securities, now futures traders it's very easy for them. They don't have to do any accounting. They get a 1099 aggregate profit and loss. It's summarized and it's realized and unrealized trading gains and losses because Section 1256 means you market to market. And you just put that number on Form 6781 Part 1 and you're done. Now securities are the big challenge and we covered that earlier you're going to need to do line-by-line -line reporting. You can't do summary reporting, and you need to report wash sales too. So if you have thousands of trades, you need to report all those lines on the 8949, and you have to reconcile it to the 1099. It's really could be difficult if you don't have the right software or solution, and trade log should be that. The new release is coming out any day now. We've been working with them closely on it for a month. And that's what you need. And otherwise, you could really be have trouble with securities. Now, tax treatment and elections. There are key differences in tax treatment. You need to be aware of that. And it affects how you do your accounting, how you do your tax reporting, and it really affects what tax rate you're paying, how your losses are handled. So the big differences are between securities and futures. Futures get the lower 60-40 tax rate, securities don't. The lower 60-40 tax rates are almost one-third off. Now, options 
a lot of people just use that word, but actually there are securities options, stock options, which are treated like securities. And then there are futures and index options, which are treated like futures. So it depends what kind of options you're trading. ETFs are securities, but there are some that are commodity ETFs where you may get a K1, and ETF options, we make a case, can be treated like futures. And precious metals have the lower, excuse me, precious metals have the higher long-term capital gains rate. So you have to be aware of that. Anything that involves precious metals, if you're holding it long-term, it's 28%, it's not 15%. Short-term is like a security. So you've got to learn the differences and then learn the different tax treatment elections. For example, this is the big one for you securities traders. Business traders can elect Section 475 mark-to-market accounting, which is ordinary gain or loss treatment. We call it tax loss insurance. If you're trading a large amount of money, a lot of people, let's say, come off of Wall Street they sign up with Lightspeed, they want a really good type of institutional type of platform, great rate. So they trade, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. If they lose 50000 in their first year, they want a business ordinary loss. Maybe they had a large wage income earlier in the year that they want to offset, or their spouse's income, or they want a net operating loss carry back. Well, yeah, if you want that, you need to elect this by April 15th of this year if you're an existing individual. If you're an existing S-Corp, you need to elect by March 15th. That's next week. So you have to focus on this benefit. That election is free, and it gets you out of the capital loss limitation. It gets you out of the wash sale treatment. You do mark things to market at year end. That's what the MTM stands for. But if you're going to cash in your business trading, there's no change. You don't have to use mark-to-market for your segregated investments where you're still holding core positions for long-term capital gain and you're enjoying deferral by holding those stocks. So you can have both mark-to-market on your business trading on securities only, keep lower 60 40 tax rates on futures and keep the cash method for your segregated investments in stocks you can have the best of all those worlds so that's a very important election to focus on now if you have a large capital loss carryover from 2011 into 2012 you may not want to elect Section 475 because what, you don't want ordinary gains. You, th you won't be able to offset them with your capital loss carryover. You would prefer to have capital gains. A lot of traders have a consultation with me to see if they qualify for trader tax status, to see if an entity can help them and to see about this election and other elections, but this one in particular. Having a new entity gives you the flexibility to elect mark to market if you need it for a big loss within 75 days and then to switch back to capital gains treatment with a do-over. So this, what I'm, what I'm talking about now is when you have that capital loss carryover. So I'll, I'm going to move on now. But if you're in that situation, you need to read my guide and content and strategies about it. And you may want to consult me about it as well. Now, if you're trading futures, we want you to retain those lower 60-40 rates in 1256. And futures have their own carry-back feature. You can carry back a futures loss three years but only against futures gains. So if you lost a good amount of money in 2011 and you didn't elect 475 and you figure, Bob, I'm stuck with these losses, now I have to carry them forward. 
and you have a futures trading gain in the prior three years, you can carry it back. That's an election you make on top of Form 6781. You check a box, and you can do that one after the fact by the time you file the return and the due date. So you need to learn when you make these elections. The 475 is by April 15th for individuals or partnerships, March 15th for S-Corps, existing ones, or if you form a new entity, it's within 75 days, and I have that slide coming up at the end. Now, business startup issues are important too. A lot of traders have pre-business education. They have a lot of expenses. They've been demo trading, simulated trading. They've been taking courses and books. And uh, I'm just checking on the time. I heard some noise in the background, Mike. We're doing pretty good. So, excuse me for my own interruption. So the pre-business education is a tricky area. Stay clear of promoters' false promises for education deductions using poorly designed multi-entity schemes. So if you're taking an expensive class somewhere and they introduce you to a tax provider who says, we can deduct it all, set up a C-Corp and an LLC, those don't work. Those are phony. They cost thousands of dollars and it's big tax trouble ahead. Read my three-part blog series from February 2010 about that on our website and read it in the guides. You can try to squeeze some pre-business education into Section 195 startup costs, and that's already aggressive. And you could then write off the first 5,000 of startup costs in the year, first year of business, and the rest over 15 years. Section 248 is organization costs, and again, you're allowed 5,000 for that too. Now, we go back six months for Section 195, and we capitalize a reasonable amount, probably under 15,000. If your courses were more than that, you might be able to apportion some to a later period. Education is a tricky area. We have significant content about it. So definitely read that and consider consulting me about it. Now, retirement plans for traders. This will be my article in the next issue of Active Trader Magazine. It's like five pages. It's a big one. It's an excerpt from Green's 2012 Trader Tax Guide. So just to step back and let's just do a quick catch up. You got your trader tax status. That unlocks the business expenses. With the home office and more, we think the average trader saves about 8000 Could be a lot more. Could be less. Your tax treatment. Well, if you can pay 12% lower rates on futures or you can deduct your business losses on securities, that's worth a lot of money to you. It could be worth tens of thousands or more. But this retirement plan strategy could save you from 2000 to another 17000 or more. The individual 401k plan is best for traders since it combines the 401k element where the most savings is with a profit sharing plan too. A married couple can save 17000 The math on that is in the guide. I actually laid it all out for you. Each one deducts the 17000 plus 5500 more because they're over age 50 plus they deduct the health insurance premiums, the income tax savings on all that, minus the self-employment tax cost on the fee you need to drive that, the net savings in your pocket 
is seventeen thousand. Plus, you got money into a retirement plan that you can grow tax-free until your retirement. Now, what I like to do is, when you're making good income, you want to contribute to the retirement plans to save taxes at a high marginal rate. And the self-employment tax cost is 15.3%. Well, it's 2% lower this year with the payroll tax cut. So you want to contribute in years where you have very good positive savings. And then in a year where your trading gains are flat, where you have a loss, and you're in a low bracket, or in a loss where you're potentially wasting your itemized deductions like your mortgage interest and real estate taxes, rather than waste those deductions and don't take it and not take advantage of a low rate, do a Roth conversion. Convert your retirement plan to a Roth IRA and all that conversion becomes income in the current year, but that soaks up the unutilized itemized deductions and gets you into a decent rate. So you built up the plan with high tax rate savings and you convert the plan to a Roth at low rates. So you do win on the tax deferral nature of a retirement plan. Once you're into the Roth, you're into permanent tax savings because it's tax-free for life and you can pass on some of those benefits to your heirs as well. Traders do well trading retirement plans, some don't, but if you can build those accounts up nicely, Think about, you know, what Governor Romney has done with his IRA. Long-term deferral and growth without paying taxes, especially if tax rates are headed higher, is a great strategy. So think about what you're doing with your retirement accounts. It's not a good idea to take a big withdrawal, which is ordinary income, if you're under age 59 and a half and you take the money out of an IRA, there's also a 10% excise tax penalty, a nasty shock for many. If you take it out of a qualified plan like an individual 401k, you can do it at 55 or older, so you get four or five years earlier with the qualified plan for those withdrawals. So don't just take you the withdrawals triggering all this tax and then go and lose the money without mark to market accounting. That's the nastiest outcome tax wise that you can imagine. And a lot of people fell in that trap. You can roll your money over from the 401k at your job when you leave the job into an individual 401k and then borrow up to $50,000 or 50% 50 of the plan assets, the lower of. So if it's 80,000 in your plan, you can only borrow 40. If there's 120,000, you can borrow 50. And you can use that 50,000 to fund your patent day trading account, let's say with Lightspeed as a patent day trader, and then have a trading business perhaps even in your entity. You have to pay the loan back in no later than five years, no later than a quarterly basis with a market rate of interest which is very low. So approach your retirement plans in the right way. Don't have them invest in your LLC. That's a prohibited transaction. Let's take a break here now, Mike, and see if we have any more questions. And then we're going to finish up with tax treatment. Why limit the six months on the startup expenses? Is that a hard rule? No, it's not. 
that is a reasonable rule that we're using. It's our policy. It, it, it might be waived in some special situations, but uh, we think that that's reasonable. Next question, if you elect trader tax status, does that mean that the income is no longer considered passive income? Passive income is not an issue in trading. Passive activity loss limitation rules, section 469, affect a lot of people who have private investments, real estate investments. The losses are passive activity losses, and they're looking for income to, to free those losses up, which are deferred. So Congress said, no way can you just go into a hedge fund because that would be too easy. So under the trading rule, hedge funds are not passive loss activities. So nothing about trading has anything to do with Section 469 and those passive loss activities. Next question. Isn't a C-Corp a taxpayer instead? Yes, a, a C-Corp is a separate taxpayer and tax filer. And that's why there's double taxation. The C-Corp pays taxes, and then when it pays a dividend to the owner, the owner pays taxes. If it's a qualifying dividend, the tax rate is the lo lower long-term rate of 15%. That, by the way, goes away when the Bush tax cuts expire. The qualifying dividend rate disappears, and it's an ordinary dividend at the ordinary rate. But factor in state taxation, too, and double taxation is not worth it. And to avoid double taxation, you need fees, and that triggers self-employment tax. Plus, losses are wasted in the C-Corp, they don't flow to your return, and C-Corps can't get lower 60-40 rates, so C-Corps are very bad for a trading business. Next question, is it easy to close a partnership? Yes, you don't really have to file dissolution papers with the state, because you didn't file formation papers with the state. So that was the questions, and let's get into tax treatment now. We covered this already, but let's fill in the blanks. We touched on it when we covered other topics. So these are the basics. Securities, which include stock options. This is the default treatment. Whether you're a business trader or not, this is the default treatment. If you want that Section 475, you need to be a business trader and elected on time. So securities have short-term and long-term capital gains. If you hold it for 12 months, it becomes a long-term capital gain. Now, the short-term capital gains are taxed at the ordinary income tax rates, which currently are up to 35%. After the Bush tax cuts expire, they jump up with phase-outs to 41%. And the health care reform Medicare tax of 3.8% applies on investment income over 250. So it really goes up to closer to 45% or 44%. So that's a big increase that could be coming for next year for short term. Now, long-term capital gains are currently taxed up to 15%, and actually at the lower brackets, it could be 0 or 10%. Those rates go up to 20% next year on the highest bracket, and with the Medicare tax, it's really 24%. Securities include equities, stocks, equity options, stock options, bonds, mutual funds, a narrow base index, there are a few of those. Most are not narrow, they're broad. And single stock futures. And ETFs are securities, but there are special rules that apply that we'll cover. Futures, which include many types of options, not stock options, but many of the other options are futures. There are tax advantages, lower tax rates on short-term trading, not lower on long-term. Actually, if you're holding something for long-term, it's better with a security. 
With futures, there's no difference between short-term and long-term. It's all 60-40, even if it's a day trade, and it's mark-to-market -mark year-end. That's why there can't be long-term, because you're marking to market before 12 months. You buy a stock on January 2nd and mark it to market year-end, that's less than 12 months. So these are Section 1256 contracts, and they include, well, we'll cover that next. So again, here's how the 60-40 works. 60% 60 is a long-term capital gain. 40% is short-term. When you do the blended math, it's 23%. That's 12% less than the ordinary rate of 35%. That's basically one-third off at the highest marginal rates and a material difference at the lower rates, too. So, 1256 contracts include your regulated futures contracts on the futures exchanges in the U.S., you know, your agriculturals, your financials, your commodities, well, that's the agriculturals, your energies, metals, all those are, and even currencies, they're regulated futures contracts on the futures exchanges. Also, the non-equity options and the broad-based indexes, the E-minis, the 100, the 500, the S&P, the Russell, the Dow, if it says X E mini 100, well, that's broad base. Broad base is defined as 10 or more underlying securities. The options on those indexes are also 1256. Now, 1256 says foreign currency contracts. That's different from RFCs, and it's a complex area, so check back with us another time on that. Now, be careful with your commodities. If you take a bushel of wheat, that's going to be ordinary income, ordinary loss. Now, ETFs, they look like they're broad-based, but they're registered investment companies, RICs, when they're a securities ETF. It's kind of like a stripped-down mutual fund of sorts. It's a security. It's like a trust trades on the Amex. So when you see something that says trust, Spired or ProShares, when you, when you, the QQQ, when you see it on the American Stock Exchange or some of those exchanges, it, it's a security. And when you sell it, you're selling a security. It's not that different from a stock, in a sense. Now, commodities or futures ETF is a little confusing. It's not a RIC. They're not allowed by the SEC to use a RIC, so they use a publicly traded partnership. And that means you're going to get a K-1 in some cases. And when you get the K-1, it might even have some Section 1256 treatment that's passed through to you. So whatever's on the K-1 you have to put on your tax return, it's extra work for you. It's a little confusing. You can find all these K-1s for the publicly traded partnerships. There are websites for them. They show what they all look like. There are instructions. So you can do that part on your own. Now, when you sell that commodities ETF, it's still a sale of a security short-term and long-term capital gains treatment. Now, this last point is very important. You need to adjust your cost basis. If, you, if they pass through some income to you that you report on your return, you should add that to your cost basis when you sell the position so you don't double count that income. It's a little more complex than what I just said, but read the instructions on that. Now, a precious metal-backed ETF, like the GLD or the SLV, it's different. It's not a RIC. It's not a publicly traded partnership, although it could be. It's a publicly traded trust, a grantor trust. A trust is kind of disregarded, meaning it's kind of like a tax nothing, so it's almost like you're selling gold bullion. Now, you might get a K-1 passing through some treatment. You've got to pick that up and do your adjustments on the cost basis too, but 
if you hold the GLD for over 12 months, the collectibles long-term capital gains rate applies, and that's 28%. Now, if it's short-term, it's the ordinary rate of up to 35%. So you're only using the collectibles rate if it's long-term, and you're not, you're not getting 60-40 on gold bullion. Now, when you sell that precious metals ETF, again, it's treated as if you're selling gold bullion. Now, options on ETFs, we believe, can be treated like futures. The, the tax treatment is actually unclear. The IRS has not issued guidance. We've done a lot of work with our tax attorneys, and so have other tax attorneys. And we've written, you know, cutting-edge content on this. We make a case for 60-40, which is good. You get the lower rates. You always want a, a chance for 60-40 if possible. Foreign futures could have the lower 60-40 rates, too. Check on their website to see if the CFTC said they could and if the IRS issued a revenue ruling as well. Now, don't miss that 475 election. You remember I covered that earlier. I probably should have just moved that slide up. If you're a qualifying business trader, you might want to consider 475. And if you're an existing taxpayer, the, the deadline is April 15th. And if you're existing S-Corp, it's March 15th. So April 15th for individual and partnerships, March 15th for S-Corps. That's step one, the most important step. That's an election statement that you attach to your 011, 2011 tax return or extension that you file by those due dates. If you're filing an extension, as an individual or a partnership, you're going to need to paper file it with that election. You can't e-file that election. You really need to be very technical about that, otherwise you're going to miss it. If you miss it, we can form an entity, and the entity as a new taxpayer, this last bullet point, a new taxpayer like a new entity can elect it internally. That means in your own books and records within 75 days of inception. You can form the entity April 1st and elect it by early June. April, May to June 15th is about 75 days. But make sure you count out the days. And it's got send yourself an email so it's in your books and records. Now, if you're an existing taxpayer, step one is that external election statement you file with the IRS. Step two is filing a Form 3115 change of accounting method. But you don't file that until 2013 when you file your 2012 tax return. A lot of accountants get confused with these two steps, and they botch it, which could jeopardize your mark-to-market. -mark don't jeopardize it. It's just way too important. So let's see how we're doing on time. 529, perfect. Perfect, Tommy, and Robert. We got. We have a few questions uh, that maybe we can address. Okay. So again, if it's an option on an ETF, we believe that it's 1256. But the ETF itself is a security. So the QQQ versus the QQQQ, I believe, is the difference there. And you can always, you know, Google the uh, symbols and see exactly what it is. It's hard for me to answer the questions about every symbol that may come up on the board. So I think I got the questions there, Mike. Uh, entities don't have to elect 475 every year. Once you elect Section 475, you're stuck with it as long as you have trader tax status. If you fall short of trader tax status, you can't use it. You go back to the cash method. And when you requalify, you use it again. There are a lot of nuances with Section 475. We are the leading firm for that code section. Um, will I get some kind of proof about filing 475? No. When you file that election statement, the IRS is not going to send you a thank you note or acknowledge anything. They won't with the 3115 either. So you're on your own. Remember the trader tax status, you're not electing, you're just using it. 
and you'll know the IRS accepted it when you didn't get hear back from them, which you should not hear if you do things right. Use Schedule C, but use our footnotes. You need our examples guides if you're going to use a local account or work on your own. Otherwise, sign up with us. Tax prep is our main business. And uh, Mike, I guess I'll turn it back to you now. Perfect. Thank well, you all for today. I really it was nice to meet you all, and we look forward to working with you. And thank you to Lightspeed and Mike Sedek. Thank you, Robert. Uh, it was a great presentation, and thank you for taking the time to answer so many of the audience questions. Uh, definitely a lot of regulations here, as everyone can see. So we certainly advise that you consult with a professional, uh, such as Robert. So with that, I'll just remind everyone that this presentation has been recorded and will be uploaded onto our website at lightspeed.com forward slash webinar. So I have a feeling a lot of people will be coming back to review all the information you presented. So thank you to Robert for the presentation, and thanks for our audience for joining us this afternoon. Have a great night, everyone.